Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, HDV Utilization Webinar, Using Administrative Fees to Improve Leasing Success. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon on the bottom right corner of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit your questions in writing, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Stephen Durham, Director of the Office of Housing Voucher Programs. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying their summer. And uh, thank you for joining us today in our latest installment of the HCV Utilization Webinar Series. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick uh, housekeeping before we get into the, today's presentation. As a reminder, uh, the webinar is recorded. Um, it will be a PowerPoint and it will be posted in the webinar and training section of the HCV page on the HUD website. Uh, look for that uh, posted posting to be available in approximately a week's time. Uh, as always, as we always all intro the, the sessions, we are always seeking additional topics uh, to cover during these utilization webinars, topics that will be beneficial to our, our PHA partners out there. Um, so please uh, enter any uh, topics or ideas that um, you believe would be good suggestions or good topics for webinars that we could uh, provide. Please enter those into the chat feature and we'll take those into consideration. Um, and all, as always, Please uh, stay connected with us uh, by subscribing to our HCV Connect newsletter. Um, that's available uh, for to sign up on our HCV webpage, also located on the uh, HUD website. Next slide, please. As you, can see, as you can see, this is our agenda for today, and the purpose of today's webinar is to provide information on the latest development in HCV's efforts to address leasing and utilization challenges in the competitive rental markets across the country through the use of administrative fees. Given the number of the tight rental markets that we're seeing the use of security deposits, assistance and landlord incentive payments is becoming increasingly necessary to help our families lease units. Recently, PIH notice 2022-18 provided public housing agencies with greater flexibility over the types of costs that they may cover with their administrative fees, but it does not require PHAs to use, fee, use their fees for these activities that are in the notice. Prior to the notice, uh, the 2022-18 notice, use of HCV administrative fees has been limited to only paying the PHAs administrative costs, cost of doing business essentially. Uh, PHAs had either used their admin fee reserves or unrestricted outside sources of funds if they wish to pay for security deposit assistance or landlord incentive payments. With specific congressional authorization, there have been a few exceptions uh, where we've permitted the use of administrative fee funding for these types of activities before. Most notably, you'll probably remember these uses are eligible with our emergency housing voucher program. Um, it was also uh, eligible under the expanded use authority provided during the CARES Act um, in response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Allowing PHAs to tap into this ex existing administrative fee funding uh, to cover all these activities gives PHAs greater flexibility in how they can address the leasing challenges in their local communities. Uh, once again, the decision to use your admin fees for these increased flexibilities rests solely with your PHA not required to do it. PHAs are not required to do it. I can't stress that in it's eligible use, but you are not required to do it. But as part of today's webcast, uh, we're going to talk about some of the best practices that we've seen out there, lessons learned from PHAs that have chosen to um, use their admin fee for some of these expanded uses. And with that, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Miguel Fontanez Sanchez. He's the director of our financial management division. Going to give you a quick overview of how HCV administrative fees are determined. And then from there, we'll get into the overview of the notice. And then at the end of this, uh, the web webinar, we'll get into uh, frequently asked questions that, that come up as it relates to these expanded uses. 
Uh, so next slide, Miguel, please take it away. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating in the webinar today. Um, I'll be providing some history of the administrative fee account. Um, and we are starting with how administrative fees are determined. So the formula for uh, determining your administrative fees is under section AQ of the 1937 Act. However, Congress has modified the formula through appropriations acts. So AQ um, establishes that your PHAs will earn administrative fees based on vouchers lease report as of the first of the month in the voucher management system or VMS. Uh, it is very critical and important that you, you know, that timely reporting in VMS because we use that data on a monthly basis. We extract that data after validation for many, many purposes like ACB dashboard for funding, uh, budget forecasting, budget implementation, cash management and funds control, just to mention some of them. Next slide, please. We use two rates to determine your administrative fees, column A and column B rates, which are based on a percentage of the 1993 and 1994 fair market rent, limited by floor and ceiling amounts, multiplied by an inflation factor that captures the increase in local wage rates over time. And I know that's a mouthful. BHAs could request blender rates to proportionally all areas in which particip participants are located. Once that blender rate is approved and established, we can go back to January 1st and fund uh, approved BHAs for blender rates started in January 1st, where we will catch up at that higher rate uh, for all approved blender rates. Um, BHAs operating over large geographic areas as well, defined as multiple counties, uh, can also request a higher administrative fee rates. We place this guidance every year on, in the implementation notice, ACV implementation notice, and provide some deadlines so you can submit those applications for both blender rates and higher AMI fee rates. How we disperse the money to your housing agency is different, right? We look at the latest um, leasing levels that we have reconciled for your housing agencies, uh, and we determine what your next month monthly advance is going to be. So it's based on your leasing levels for, from your latest reconcile, uh, reconciliation. And we usually use 112 of the total appropriation. The, the uh, proration has been lower than 100%. So we go ahead and use 112 of the total appropriation every month. Next slide, please. Regulations for administrative fees are under 24 CFR 982-152. And that, you know, uh, establishes that PHAs will cover costs uh, to perform PHA administrative responsibilities of the ACB program. As Stephen mentioned, they were, you know, uh, those uh, operating expenses or uh, PHA administrative responsibilities were uh, described under operating expenses, including uh, eligible payments to this uh, central office cost center or COCC cost to help families uh, facing difficulties finding units, extraordinary costs as determined and necessary by uh, this determined necessary by by HUD, and also preliminary fees among other expenses. Uh, a no-no is that the PHAs may not use administrative fees to loan uh, or the funds cannot be loaned to uh, other programs even when the intent is to reimburse the housing choice voucher program at a later date. Next slide, please. So the next slide provides you with the appropriations for since 20, 2010 all the way through 2021 compared to expenses you have reported in the voucher management system. That's the linear uh, trend chart that you see at the bottom left and not at the top left and the bottom left is compared to the eligibility we have determined uh, through quarterly reconciliations and annual reconciliations. That downward heartbeat that you see in 2013, that's the sequester. That's the lower proration that I know in the history of the ACB program. Uh, as you can see uh, from 2017 on the bottom linear chart, from 2017 to 2021, they run parallel, but 
getting closer to eligibility in 2021 and a little bit closer in 2022 when uh, because we are funding housing agencies at 91 92 percent per ratio which was uh, uh, good news for all housing agencies in 2022. next slide please So with the publication of PIH notice 2022-18, just the use of, of the use of ACB and mainstream voucher AMI fees for other expenses to assist families to lease units, we are providing guidance to your housing agency on the other expense eligible activities. So you can facilitate leasing or you can improve leasing utilization and give families the also give families the opportunity to look for housings in opportunity neighborhoods. These other expenses include but not are not limited to security and utility deposits, landlord outreach and incentives, application fees, holding fees, and renter's insurance if required by the lease. Next slide, please. When you see um, side by side what the administrative activities were Prior to this notice, you can see uh, how we have we have expanded the uses of the administrative fees to, you know, what I mentioned before, owner incentives, retention payments, um, security deposit and utility deposits, even utility arrears. So we know how important it is to and and what are the uh, constraints in, in many of your markets to lease up or exp expediting. Uh, families to lease up those units. I think with, with this expansion on the uses of administrative fee, you will be able to improve your utilization and again, provide, provide the families with that uh, better choices uh, uh, in the future uh, to look for neighborhoods of opportunities. Next slide, please. As you adopt, uh, as you adopt this policy, um, make sure that your PHA administrative plan is revised accordingly, including limitations and eligibility criteria for these uh, other expense activities. While you revise your administrative plan, make sure that at least you respond to these two questions, right? Is your policy fair and consistent with no discrimination? Or are your, your costs necessary and reasonable? Those are two basic questions that you make sure that you can respond as you uh, update your administrative plan. Next slide, please. Also, uh, make sure that you have an agreement with the tenant to ensure that as you adopt, for example, the security and utility deposits, make sure that any unused uh, amounts is promptly returned to the housing agency. Make sure that you read carefully the guidance in 2022-18 for um, uh, for these, uh, so so you can establish that agreement with it, with the families. Next slide, please. You may have questions also about how long is this policy um, eligible for? Is is this only for 2022? And the response is no. This will um, uh, remain eligible uh, as eligible administrative fee expense uh, eligible activities uh, in future years provided the Appropriations Act continues to include that language on other expenses. If there are significant changes on the Appropriations Act, we will revise this notice accordingly and as soon as possible. Um, I'm gonna transfer now to uh, the presentation to Alison Bell. She's uh, one of our Senior Housing Program Specialists for the Public Housing um, Management Occupancy Division. Alison, you want to take it over? Thank you, Miguel. Um, next slide, please. All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us today to learn about this notice and how it might be helpful in addressing your leasing and utilization challenges that you might be having. Um, it's pretty exciting to think about how your agency could start using its administrative fees to assist with leasing given this new notice. Um, but there's also a lot to consider prior to implementation, which I'm sure many of you guys have already started grappling with. Um, but one important thing to note, just kind of off the top, is that if your PHA wants to use your administrative fees for these additional purposes, 
you must first adopt a policy in your PHA admin plan, which Miguel described, and that's going to govern the terms and conditions of this activity or any of these activities you're um, implementing, including any limitations or eligibility criteria for those activities. So, for example, if you wanted to limit this, uh, these activities just to leasing unit scenarios of opportunity, or maybe just to support families experiencing or at risk of homelessness, you'll need to state that in your admin plan. And I also should uh, take this opportunity to, to clarify that the only authorized other expenses, um, those other expense activities at this time are those that are listed in the notice. So that, that's your parameters of things you can do with your administrative fee expenses for these other expense activities. Um, and, you know, I'd really encourage everybody to read the notice all the way through. I think I learn something every time I read it again. Um, but one thing to note is, is the notice is pretty clear. You can include limitations or establish certain criteria for the activities you're going to implement, but that you can't create policies or criteria or, or ways of administering these funds that would result in discrimination against in individuals with protected characteristics under fair housing and civil rights laws and regulations. So you always want to keep that in mind. Um, and as always, you, you'll always need to be able to provide reasonable accommodations when necessary. Um, so, you know, you do have to update your admin plan, but before you even get to that point where you're able to draft your plan and take it to the board, you've really got to figure out, you know, how much of your admin fees do you think you can have available for these um, other expenses? And what exactly, like what initiatives that are outlined in the notice uh, would you really want to do and how would you go about implementing them? So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the things that you might want to do to get started with planning for adopting these activities. And so one of the things you'll want to do, which is sort of obvious, um, is take a look at what your current costs are for administering the HCB program and comparing that to how much admin fee you're actually bringing in. And so, you know, do you even have any administrative fee available to adopt these additional uses at this time? But what also might be a pretty important piece of this and important to look at is your utilization and your leasing potential. So if your utilization rate isn't very high, you are missing out on administrative fee earnings because remember every, uh, you earn admin fee for every unit you have leased on the first of the month. So if you have fewer units leased, you're earning less admin fee. And we should, you sh we should know this just isn't an admin fee either. The more units you have leased, the more um, happy you're spending, and that will impact your renewal funds for the next year um, because it's based on your, your prior year uh, spending. So anyhow, there's this, there's you know clearly a relationship between having units leased and earning admin fees. So it may be, even if you don't feel like you have a lot of additional administrative fee to use for these additional purposes, you still might want to consider whether using some admin fee to help families lease units could actually result in you having more overall admin fee available. Um, that's a lot to consider, and we'd encourage you guys to take a little take a little bit of time and do analysis on your current expenses, your current fee earnings, and also your leasing potential to get a really good overall picture of any admin fee availability or possibility that you might have um, as you start thinking about the, these new. Um, Activities. Next slide, please. Um, and so you all are probably very well aware there's there's over 2,100 housing agencies that administer vouchers. So the issue that one PHA experiences is, is probably not the same as another. And so the notice provided a range of options for PHAs to help with leasing, including landlord incentives, utility deposits. Security deposits, application fees, and renter's insurance. And so you don't have to adopt all of the options in the notice, and all of the options might not be needed in all places. So to figure out which of the new uses might be helpful to you and your PHA in achieving your goals, you might want to spend a little bit of time just trying to articulate the problem you're trying to solve as you draft your local policy. So depending on your local circumstances, you might be trying to resolve not just issues with utilization, um, although we know that that's a, a challenge in a lot of places, but maybe you're just seeing decreased landlord participation and you wanna make sure that you're remaining competitive in the market, that you're starting to see signs of some softening in, in your participation in your program. Or maybe you're finding um, 
the families are tending to be concentrated only in certain parts of your jurisdiction. And you want to specifically target more landlords and low poverty poverty neighborhoods to give families more options of where they can live. Um, or you might be finding, um, you know, a lot of families do decently well searching for units, but other certain populations are having a harder time finding units and you want to provide more assistance to a specific population to help them lease units. And then 1 other thing to consider is it's not always about like the pre you know, finding a unit that makes utilization challenging or finding a landlord. Um, sometimes families are having a hard time leasing because of utility deposits. So there's these family financial barriers that exist as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of steps along the way in the leasing problem uh, process and a lot of variables that depend on your local market to consider. And so taking a step back and understanding exactly what issues your families are facing will help you determine how to make the best use of your admin fees to help lease up because certainly um, you know, this notice didn't come with additional funding and we know that a lot of your admin fees are already spoken for. So you may want to think about how to prioritize them or prioritize the uses uh, to best meet your local goals. Um, so, you know, once you've figured out what the local challenges you want to tackle, um, you're going to want to figure out, okay, well then what strategies do I need to consider? And the new notice. Um, that requires you to not only put your new policies in the admin plan, but some of the activities actually require that you're going to need to engage in some sort of agreement with the family and sometimes the owner. So there's a number of details you're going to want to work out ahead of time before implementing to make sure that you're fully in compliance with with this notice. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so. Although PIH notice 2022-18 was just published last month, um, over the past few years, we at HUD have been working to develop and share information on leading practices in landlord engagement and other strategies to improve utilization. So as this um, new notice describes, as Stephen mentioned, in recent years, there have been special programs and funding streams authorized by Congress have allowed PHAs to provide landlord incentives, including those CARES Act admin fees and the emergency housing voucher program. And additionally, HUD's been working with nine um, housing agency sites uh, to launch the community choice demonstration, which was specifically authorized by Congress, and it will provide about 10,000 voucher families with kids access to lower poverty neighborhoods. And it also includes many of the activities allowable in PIH notice 2022-18. Um, so what you're looking at here on the slide is a number of resources available right now for your PHA to take a look at and see how other PHAs have been implementing landlord incentives to a variety of different population types. But one thing to keep in mind, though, is that the examples you see may or may not be eligible uses under this new PIH notice. So for your regular HCV admin fees, the uses described in PIH notice 2022. <laughs> 2022-18 are the only ones available, and that's the governing document. So we think all these resources could be helpful um, and encourage you to take a look at them. But the one that we think is probably most closely aligned to the exercise of trying to figure out what activities might be best for your agency is the HCV Landlord Strategies Guidebook. Next slide, please. And so the Landlord Strategies Guidebook can be used in one of two ways. Um, you can open up the full entire guidebook in one PDF, which is that document you're seeing on the left. I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like. Or on um, the web page, you can click into individual chapters you want to read, which is what that screenshot on the right is of. And you can also see that each individual chapter that we published had an associated webinar. So if you look, you can see that we had a chapter called, or we have a chapter called monetary incentives and reimbursement funds. And then there's a webinar related to that. So that's pretty directly applicable to um, this new notice. And it gives a lot of ideas of how you even go about starting to think about these things to examples of places that have been doing this work already. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at that. But I'm gonna go ahead and share just a few examples today from HCV programs that have been able to use special fees for landlord recruitment and retention prior to this notice, 
I don't mean to be a broken record, but just want to say again, these programs may have slightly different rules than for the regular HCB admin fees covered under the notice. So just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So for the community choice demonstration, the goal is to help voucher families with children access areas of opportunity. And families that participate receive what we're calling comprehensive mobility related services, which is really just a package of services that are aimed at helping them lease a unit in an opportunity area. And as part of that package of services, um, which I should mention, the program offers all of the services to each family, but each family doesn't have to take up all of the services. It's a voluntary program. Um, but there's a number of similar activities as um, in the, the new PIH notice. So in the demonstration, PHAs can provide what we call flexible family, I'm sorry, flexible financial assistance to families, and that's related to their housing search. So that's including application fees, administrative fees, transportation assistance, utility arrears and connection fees, as well as move-in deposits and um, move-in fees. And the program can also provide um, holding fees and security deposits of up to two months rent. And then there's intensive housing search assistance and opportunity areas. Um, and property owners that are renting to a participant in this program, they can receive up to uh, half one month's rent, one month's contract rent as a lease up bonus. And additionally, the, um, there's a damage mitigation fund that landlords can access should there be any tenant cause damages in excess of the security deposit. And I should note, we don't really anticipate that damage mitigation fund being tapped into all that extensively, but we do think it's um, in the context of the demonstration, a good property owner recruitment strategy because damages um, is often stated as a concern by property owners. So switching gears just a little bit, we're gonna look at two examples from the housing voucher program. I mean, emergency housing voucher program Um, so for the emergency housing program, and so uh, I think most of you all know this is targeted to families experiencing or at risk of homelessness, as well as families in domestic violence situation. Um, so these families are in especially challenging situations, and the program came with additional service fees for PHAs to use to help families lease and find units. And again, the allowable uses of those EHV funds and how the policies were implemented may be different than this new notice. So always that's your governing document, but we thought these examples could be illustrative of how PHAs have implemented similar activities. Next slide, please. Oh, you're already there. Okay, thank you. Um, so the Housing Authority of Santa Barbara has a pretty high EHV utilization rate, which means they've been pretty successful at using their vouchers. So they chose to use their EHV services fee to provide signing bonuses, security deposit assistance, and a landlord mitigation fund. And so Santa Barbara, I think we all know, is probably a pretty high cost area. So if this is giving you a little bit of sticker shock again, um, what makes sense for one PHA might not be the right fit for another, perhaps in a lower cost area. Next slide, please. And looking at another high utilization EHV PHA, the Greenville Housing Authority, you can also see that they're offering landlord signing bonuses, but they're providing different amounts based on whether it's a new landlord or an existing landlord. But in all cases, they're providing some signing bonus when the property owner brings an additional unit online with the program. And similar to Santa Barbara and the community choice demonstration, they're also offering a landlord mitigation fund and security deposit assistance. And they're also helping families pay application fees for units, and this can be especially important since sometimes voucher families have to apply for a lot of units to be approved. And those costs can be problematic. They, they can really add up for uh, low income families, especially. Next slide. Um, so I think it's important to highlight that although the examples we just <laughs> talked about are really uh, largely about landlord recruitment and retention. Um, PIH knows 2022-18 also recognizes the financial barriers families face can be a challenge in leasing. So we wanted to highlight that the 
that the notice allows housing agencies to pay some or all of the utility deposit. And that payment may go to the utility com company directly, or you could provide those funds to the family. But if you provide the funds to the family, you must establish an agreement with the family and verify that those utility expenses were indeed paid. And this type of agreement also comes into play if the security deposits paid to the family. So we really encourage you to read all of the notice uh, before developing your policies and drafting your admin plan updates, because you'll need to be prepared to address all these nuances of your policies. There's a lot of um, decisions you might be wanting to, to consider are uh, making. Um, and then finally, the notice also allows PHAs to address utility arrears that were um, incurred by the family prior to admission to the voucher program. So sometimes families can't get utilities turned on in their name until these arrears are paid. And so PHAs could use their admin fees to assist with these pre-admission arrears. Um, all right, well, I think that's, uh, that's it. I hope these examples of what PHAs are doing to assist families in leasing and recruiting and retaining landlords have been helpful as you think about how you might wanna leverage this new PIH notice to help address challenges in your local rental markets and programs. Um, and there are many more examples in the resources we showed you earlier. And I'm gonna put those links directly in the chat now if, if we haven't already. Um, so take, uh, be on the lookout for those in just a moment. And uh, I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back, I'm gonna turn it over to Chad. All right, thanks a lot, Allison. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we've got a number of uh, questions so far on this notice. So we have some queued up right now that we're gonna do as part of this presentation, but I'd encourage you, and I know a few people have already done this, but if you have questions you'd like to ask us right now, like please enter them in the chat and we'll use the remainder of this uh, time to try and cover whatever questions we can. Uh, the first one that we've heard a bit is, uh, did HUD make more administrative fees available for purposes in this notice? And uh, that the answer, as we've mentioned earlier, is no. There, these, you know, we're expecting that uh, the current allocation of admin fees that you have uh, or PHAs have would be used for these or could potentially, it's up to the PHA. Next slide, please. Uh, are PHAs required to use their administrative fees to cover activities outlined in this notice? And so, as, as you know, Stephen had emphasized this, uh, no, right? This is a, a decision uh, to provide this assistance is really uh, rest solely with the PHA. Uh, it's really intended to just give you a little bit more flexibility uh, and to help you address your local uh, housing needs. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, do you have to update my administrative plan before I use the admin fees uh, for uses described in this notice? So, as we mentioned earlier, and then Allison just emphasized, yes, we do. That's this is one of the very first uh, steps here is to update your uh, HCV administrative plan in order to really uh, establish a fair, consistent policy for using these uh, administrative fees. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, another question we've got is how much may PHA spend for activities described in this notice, you know, security deposits, landlord incentives, utility deposits, et cetera. And what we would ex expect you to look at here is really uh, the guidance in 2 CFR 200, uh, which outlines basically that all federal funds uh, are you're expected to use for uh, necessary and reasonable expenses. There's a further caveat with regard to security deposits, and that's that, and this is outlined in the notice, but it's that you cannot exceed the actual security amount uh, required by the owner or the maximum allowed by state or applicable local law. So um, a little extra caveat there, but the general principle is uh, necessary and reasonable as you're probably familiar with from other federal programs. Next slide. Can PHAs apply the same flexibility to mainstream voucher administrative fees? And the answer there is yes. This uh, the notice outlines this and extends the same flexibilities to the mainstream administrative fees. Um, I think the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, that the mainstream administrative fees are intended to help with the administration of the mainstream voucher and the regular voucher administrative fees are intended to help with the administration of the regular voucher program. So no co-mingling there, 
but I'm sure you're all familiar with this requirement already, but that's something to remind you of. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have, uh, we've got a few questions, and again, this is outlined in the notice, but you do uh, have to report these expenses. Right now, you would report the administrative expenses under the regular administrative expense field in BMS, so the voucher management system. So you just can add that into your monthly uh, reporting of administrative fees. And then in FDS, the financial data schedule, you would generally report these under FDS line uh, 92400, the tenant services other line. Um, however, the use of deposits can be a little bit tricky, and so that's what we cover in the next FAQ. So, uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, the reporting of security deposits uh, can be tricky. Um, I mean, I think generally what I would recommend here is just following, you know, each PHA may have a slightly different accounting treatment there. Uh, it's going to be based on your auditor's interpretation of the gap, the uh, standards, as well as the applicable uh, individual state laws. Um, HUD doesn't have any specific F. DS requirements in this area. So again, we're going to expect you to really work with your uh, auditor in, in, in reporting those FDS amounts. Um, the PHA's records must be uh, able to link the specific fees used by a family to the actual deposits made on their behalf. Um, and any deposit that uh, are returned to the PHA, as we covered earlier, they have to be uh, retained for the original fee uh, type and can be used for eligible costs for that fee type. And as Miguel mentioned far earlier in the presentation, when you are making payments to deposits uh, for tenants, there has to be this PHA tenant agreement. It's outlined in much greater detail in the notice, but that agreement has to be in place to ensure that the uh, tenants know that those funds have to be returned to HUD right away and they understand whatever penalty might be applied if, if those funds aren't returned to HUD. Next slide, please. All right, so we have a few reminders. Um, first, and the, the notice outlines this, but we have set up a mailbox to handle questions specifically for this notice. It's hcvutilization at hud.gov. If you have any questions, please shoot an email there. Um, and I know we've mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's also worth noting that um, this webinar will be recorded and posted uh, along with all the other HCV utilization webinars at uh, www.hud.gov backslash HCB. And before I go to the very last slide, I just want to know um, if I haven't seen any other questions come in on the chat. Um, has anyone, I think I see there was one. Stephen, did you see any that you'd like to cover? Um, I, I do. I see one here, and it is regards to whether or not um, there will be a uh, it's from, uh, I believe, Lisa, Lisa Stevens, and the question is, do you think there's any chance HCV may fund landlord incentives other than requiring PHAs to use their prorated admin fee income to do so in the future? Um, currently, the answer is uh, is no, but that is uh, something that, you know, always is uh, up for consideration and discussion as we recognize that the admin fee um, in the past has... Uh, uh, been at a lower proration this year. We did come in at uh, close to 92%, so substantial increase over the years past, uh, which is uh, part and parcel of the reason why we uh, recognize that some of these updated flexibilities would be possible for PHAs this year. Um, but currently, uh, the use of uh, HAP funds for these type of activities is prohibited, as HAP is specifically for uh, rental assistance. Um, but, but Lisa, the conversation continues as uh, as we recognize that it's difficult, becoming more and more difficult for our families to secure units, um, that uh, thoughts outside of the normal box are, are becoming more important. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, can't, can't say for certain, but can't say that we won't continue to try to get some additional flexibility. And then I see another question in the chat here uh, from DD Jax. We have, uh, will we need to report each of these expenses individually in the VMS submission? And the answer for that is right, right now, no. These are all 
uh, just under the admin fee expenses amount that you would port monthly in BMS. Uh, so just lump it in with your other administrative fee reporting. Uh, and then, so would we need to separate, I think, general ledger codes for each type of these listed activities here? Uh, no, we have the FDS uh, item is where you would report in FDS. And then for your own PHA counting, yes, like we would expect that you would still account for these funds. So I'm, I think if you need further clarification on the reporting, just again, shoot an email to hcvutilization at hud.gov. We're happy to help. Um, one other thing I would like to just make available or remind everybody is that uh, these slides will be available uh, and a recording of this video. Uh, we have a webinar section at hud.gov backslash HCV. And if you go there, you can see this webinar probably in about a week. Um, we'll have it up and you can see all our prior webinars and you can also see upcoming webinars. And in fact, if you wanna flip to the last page here, um, I can go over uh, one last reminder. Uh, please feel free to keep asking questions in the chat in the meantime, but uh, I just wanted to make sure you're all aware of these resources we've been making available for HCV utilization. I think HUD has been really trying hard over the past uh, uh, couple of years to uh, increase the resources available. And so if you haven't yet done it, please consider signing up for HCV Connect. Uh, this is our email newsletter. It's focused explicitly on HCV uh, program issues and reminders on HCV program guidance. There's notifications of webinars, events, and research. And again, you can find uh, the sign up for this HCV Connect at our website. Uh, we have an HCV utilization webinar series where I mentioned earlier. We've had a lot of great topics so far. We've had some covering uh, tenant search assistance, the 2022 funding, how to use project based vouchers, landlord engagement, using the uh, the payment standard and two year tools. There's just a bunch of great topics there. And so uh, please go check out those webinars. And if you are, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier, if you're interested in other topics, please let us know. Um, we have a new HCV utilization video series, which uh, is also available under the webinar series section of the HCV uh, website. Uh, there's our short little videos covering all sorts of different HCV administrative topics. We're hoping these are a little bit more digestible than maybe going to the full notices in some cases. Uh, we've been doing ongoing support of our uh, great HCV utilization tools. Uh, we still have the HCV data dashboard to make sure the program is uh, as transparent as possible for everybody. Um, as I know we've dropped this quite a bit, but I just want to remind everybody we tried to keep the simplify and streamline the website here. It's just hud.gov backslash HCV. And if you are looking for something to do on Thursday, August 25th, we have our next installment of the HCV utilization webinar series coming up. We're gonna focus on rent reasonableness. Uh, the registration link is on the website and uh, we encourage you all to um, uh, sign up there. And then finally, I think um, there is a question here about uh, examples of discrimination that may occur. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll defer to others on the call. I would say, what, I think what we're looking for here is probably just a reasonable uh, approach and what would be consistent. I don't think there's any prohibition against offering incentives only to new landlords. Um, so hey, Chad, hopefully I then. I could, <laughs> I, I could jump in on this one, and there was a very, there was another Thank similar you. one that you may have missed. It scrolled by pretty fast. Um, so we so we received two questions all, along the same lines of, um, you know, you have a, a finite number of admin fees, and so one person wrote in, if we provide security deposits for all participants, they would use all their admin fees, and um, they don't know how you could do it for some and not for others. And then the second question, um, Chad, as you mentioned, is. You know, can can you offer incentives only to new landlords, or would you have to offer it to all? Um, and so, you know, when thinking about how you would craft this, you know, understanding how much admin fee you have available, I would imagine in most cases you don't have enough admin fee available to serve every single family or every single landlord exactly the same. Um, 
so the the notice specifically allows you to limit the incentive. You could limit the payments to new owners uh, specifically. So if you want to take a, a look at the notice and feel comfortable about just limiting it to new owners, you could do that. It, it says it in the notice. Um, or you could limit it to owners in high opportunity neighborhoods. Um, or you could um, work with, you know, potentially if you only felt like you had enough money to do it with your mainstream admin fee and maybe not your whole voucher program. Um, so you are able to, you know, work within your available admin fee to offer this and you can find ways to limit it to, to certain populations. But what you can't do is violate the Fair Housing Act. So you couldn't say something like, you know, I'm only going to serve this specific um, group of people that speak the specific language or this group of people that look like this. So you have to keep in mind you know, how the Fair Housing Act and civil, other civil rights acts apply so that you're not discriminating, but you can limit it to like, uh, this is a landlord bonus just for landlords who are signing on uh, with the program for the first time. Or perhaps you find that, um, you know, you've got uh, families who are experiencing homelessness and they're in urgent housing situations and they especially need the security deposit and maybe families that are already on your program that are in a unit <laughs> renting right now and they're just moving to another unit well they should probably have a security deposit and so you're gonna you you know i don't envy the position you're in having to make choices about how to use scarce resources um but i point you to the notice that's pretty uh that uh, might give you some level of comfort that you can <laughs> figure out how to how to parse the funds out a little bit and target them and there's not an expectation that in every instance you would be able to serve every family. Um, Chad, I don't know if you had anything to add on to that one. I do not think I could do a better job than uh, you just did. So <laughs> thank you so much, Allison. I um, I don't see any other new questions uh, in the chat, and so I think I think this may be it. So thanks everybody for um, calling in today and for the presenters, and hopefully we'll see you on uh, August 25th. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.